My name is Jeffrey Stockbridge. I'm in, currently in South Philadelphia and it is snowing outside. So uh, my dad gave me my first camera when I was 16 years old. I was a skateboarder and I started skateboarding when I was 11. When you're a skateboarder in the city, it gives you uh, a lot of freedom to go into any neighborhood you want, looking for interesting obstacles to skateboard on and interesting tricks to do. It brought me to see different parts of the city that I probably would have never have seen otherwise. And having a camera with me gave me even f another reason to be there. Growing up in Maryland, uh, I wasn't far from Philadelphia and only two hours away. And Philadelphia is, <clears throat> and has been for a long time, the East Coast capital of skateboarding. That the impulse to skateboard in Love Park is so strong. It's like one of the best places like to skate. You know what I mean? It's like skating paradise. So I naturally, when I got out of high school, I moved to Philadelphia. So I guess it wasn't until uh, my junior year, the end of my third year in college, that I had first started to create a body of work that had some seriousness to it. So let me break it down for you. When I moved to Philly, this was my first time really living in a city. And I lived in poorer neighborhoods in West Philadelphia, where there were a lot of abandoned houses. Each of these imminently hazardous properties, these hundred properties, are all a time bomb ready to go off. And it is only by the grace of God that they don't go off on any particular day. Take a look at this abandoned shack behind me. For three years, it was on the city's list of most dangerous buildings, slated to be destroyed this past fall. I was curious. I wanted to know where these houses came from. Why were they abandoned? You know, what happened to the people that had lived there? So I started to investigate that. It was remarkably easy to gain access. Sometimes you could walk right in the front door. Sometimes a window would be open. You could go in the back door or a cellar door. And I would basically find a way to get inside these abandoned houses. And I would make photographs of the interiors very interested in capturing a sense of the memory of the past occupants who lived there. I also found incredible artifacts left behind, old letters, family photographs, journal entries by the people who had once called this structure a home. So it was through photographing these abandoned houses for years. I did that for maybe four or five years. Uh, and I had met a lot of people during that time. Um, and at first, I, you know, honestly, I was kind of scared of them. I, I didn't really want to have any contact with the people that I was meeting inside these abandoned houses. They were homeless. They were addicted to drugs. I didn't necessarily feel safe in their presence. After a while, that all changed. I started to grow more comfortable talking to the people that I was running into. It's fun right here, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was born and raised here in uh, 1965. Making connections with people in the neighborhoods that I was photographing. Say that again for me. I just want to get that on there. Um, it's God's way of telling me if I can, if I think I can do these drugs again and shoot heroin in my arm, it's like he gives me a little sign. Look down at your arm, you idiot. That's like me with these tattoos. And I realized that, hey, here's a third element of the project that I totally forgot about. The actual people that are still living in the neighborhood that everybody else abandoned. And my children, I'd have to look them in the eye before I actually brought it up to my face. I got them right after I stopped drinking in 05. Can I photograph your arm? I had met a woman named Millie who was selling her body inside of a crack house. She was literally going to different crack houses around West Philadelphia um, in search of people with drugs that she could exchange sex for drugs. And I found her story to just be harrowing. It was um, incredible. I mean, I can't tell you why Millie decided to talk to me. You're gonna have to ask her. 
who knows when the last time was that somebody asked her about her life or asked her where she came, where she grew up or how she survived. You know, I think it's as simple as saying that, you know, I was, uh, you know, a disruption to her uh, daily routine. And um, that may have been uh, interesting to her. Maybe that's it. I don't know. I'm just speculation. So I, we hung out one afternoon. I photographed her while the sun set. She told me her life story. Um, and it was this single interaction that really spurred me in a new direction and was the reason that I started to visit Kensington and start the new body of work, Kensington Blues. When I'm walking down the street in Kensington and I'm interested in making photographs, I'm just walking the streets and I'm just stopping and saying hi to people and talking to them. It's never about, hey, can I take your photograph? It's always, hey, how's it going today? You know, what's going on? Just trying to have a conversation with people like they're human beings, not like I'm after something, not like I'm only here for one reason, because I'm not. The first time we met, I had been clean for almost two years. Krista, Kensington resident and longtime collaborator with Jeffrey. I did 13 months in jail and then was in a recovery house. And um, as soon as I finished probation, relapsed. And, you know, I probably been out on the street for maybe two and a half months at this point. Back with a pimp. And I was extremely disappointed in myself. Uh, but at the same time, like I had told you before, I never really expected myself to even make it to this age, you know, which was 30, whatever, um, and expected myself to fully wind up as just an old junkie, um, not lucky enough to overdose and die. I remember when you approached me, I had heard about you from other other girls. And um, I remember when you approached me thinking, you know, of course, the first thing I think when somebody says, I'd like to take a photo of you, uh, my first thought is, you want to take, you know, dirty photos of me, <laughs> not this and and interview me and actually care about you know what was going on in my life and how I wound up there etc I liked what you were doing I was kind of um I don't know if excited is the right word but um yeah I was excited that somebody was looking at me as a human being and not um, somebody that sticks a needle in their arm every day. Uh, a nuisance to society. I, I, I've always been interested in telling my story. Um, on my computer, I probably have maybe almost 10, you know, uh, beginnings of, you know, my own book I'd like to write about my life, you know. I've been written about several times by by this point, and um, for someone to tell me that after seven years they still think about me and the impact that my story or me as a person has had on their life to the point to where they remember you know, so many details about me that they want to write about me is, um, you know, of course, flattering in a good and bad way, but um, makes me realize that, um, you know, I, 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 I want my story to be told and, and I would like to tell it myself. You know, I think that that, makes 
the people that I'm photographing and meeting want to share their story for that specific reason. They want to be remembered. Um, and Krista says the exact same thing. She doesn't know when she gets into a car if she's going to get back out of that car. She's hopping, you know, in automobiles with strangers, turning tricks for $20, $40, $60 dollars a date. Um, you know, there's a lot of unpredictability there. And I think that that was one of the main reasons that she wanted to share her story with me. I mean, I have a scar right here. Uh, you know, guy picked me up, beat the shit out of me, split my face open, broke three bones in my face, um, and basically said to me, the reason I pick on someone like you is because no one notice, no one would notice if you disappeared. And um, it's true. And sadly, you know, it, it's true. And <clears throat> so, yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that played a part in it. Kind of like, well, you know, I, I better get some of this stuff out there in case I get into the wrong car one of these days and then maybe there'll be something left behind of me of how I felt you know of what was really going on any person with a um, you know a, a little bit of uh, knowledge of photography or just representation in general would recognize that a photograph of somebody at one point in time in their life doesn't need to be um, uh, a statement for who that person is for their entire life. You know, like this, a photograph is just representing a moment in time. Okay. And that's what Krista talks about, a moment in time. She likes knowing that she likes being able to look at photographs of what she used to look like at a certain moment in time so that she can remember who she was then because she's changing and she's not the same person she was then. She's completely different. I have always, always wanted any kind of photo from um, when I was using in my life um, at one point. I tried to get copies of all of my mug shots throughout the years. And um, the Philadelphia Police Department told me that um, no, I could not have copies because my image was the property of the Philadelphia Police Department. And I said, well, that photo may be your property, but it's still my image. I'm not asking you for the originals. I'm asking you for even a photocopy of it. Um, just because I, I like, you know, I, I like to see the progression. I like to, it's a reminder to me, you know, like this, like, I don't want to look like this again. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's just a reminder. She's grown a lot. Now, it doesn't, just because she's, gone back to using here or there doesn't mean that, um, you know, that she is just an, an, an addict for life. I mean, to get clean, it takes time. Um, you have to, you stumble when you're walking, you know, you, you, you that's part of the process. Um, so I never feel like when I'm photographing people on the street who are deep in their addiction, as if I'm, um, forever, uh, defining them as an addict. I don't feel that way at all. I feel as though I'm in a unique position to get to know somebody when they are in a very vulnerable state. I'm in a unique position to spend time with somebody when they need somebody to spend time with, to tell you the truth. No, I do not pay my subjects. Kensington Blues is a collaborative effort between myself and the people that I photograph. Um, everyone I photograph is a willing participant. Um, they want their stories to be heard or they want their image to be out there. 
Um, you know, they, everyone I photograph has different reasons for why they want to do this, you know? Um, sometimes it's, they actually just want a picture of themselves that I can bring back to them in a week. Um, sometimes they, they hope that the picture will make it on the internet so that their loved ones know that they're still alive, that they still exist. It becomes very complex. Artist, photographer and educator, Gemma Rose Turnbull. Particularly in an environment like um, a street-based community, and street-based communities are hustling communities. Those people who are existing in those communities have to find diverse ways to survive and have to find diverse ways to meet their diverse needs. And some of those needs can include life-controlling drug addictions. And so I can imagine um, the challenge when a photographer like Jeffrey comes to that community and is a part of that community and makes images based in that community, that it might be really difficult for members of that community to accept that they are his commercial venture in some senses. You know, people think, you know, you're going to make millions of dollars off of this book. You know, I can't believe he's selling this book for $60 and he's only giving 2% to Prevention Point or whatever it is. And, you know, me trying to explain to people, you know, like, like he did this on his own. Like, he probably lost money doing this. So if there's ever a situation that somebody reaches out and they're upset about something, I want to talk to them. You know, I'm happy. I am happy to have that conversation with anybody I've photographed. I really do. I mean, I want to, um, I want to feel as though that I'm in a, I feel as though I'm in a position to be like, hey, like, look, this is, this is kind of like an education. Let me explain something to you. You want to know how much the book cost me? $45,000. Cost me forty five thousand dollars. You want to know how many years of my life I spent photographing this stuff? About ten thus far. Okay, film and processing and time and effort, everything all told, I will never break even. You know, I have probably would express cynicism over um, people with life controlling drug addictions and people who are experiencing homelessness and people who are working in street based sex work being the continued subject of um, documentary photographers. But this project has definitely endeared itself to me because of the longevity of commitment, because of um, the fact that Jeffrey is clearly not entirely um, resolved in his methodological approach, the fact that he's trying to incorporate people's own experiences in such a rigorous way. The whole, especially in the media, the whole uh, debate about whether addiction is a, a disease or a choice. I, I'm, a, I'm a drug addict. I'm a person that if I have a drink, I can't stop. And so it would be following your ideology that I'm choosing to do that. That I'm choosing. That's exactly my, not my ideology, it is my belief. Yes, you do choose. This is the stigma that people with substance use disorders face every single day. The only way to solve the drug problem is through toughness. When I was in China, and other places, by the way, I said, Mr. President, do you have a drug problem? No, 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 we do not. I said, what do you attribute that to? Well, uh, the death penalty. Is this something that I can't help? Or am I just a scumbag? Am I just, you know, saying fuck you to everybody that cares about me? We have this disproportionate focus on addiction in the media. Professor Dr. Carl Hart of the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. That is when we have uh, the vast majority of people who use drugs do not meet criteria for addiction, but yet that's where our focus is. Why do we have this disproportionate focus? The drugs that we're talking about are drugs like crack cocaine, heroin, uh, even MDMA, or some of the recreational drugs. When we talk about drugs in our popular culture, almost e immediately the refrain is addiction. Now, the thing that the listener should know is that the vast majority of people that use any of those drugs are not addicted. So you only have about 10 to 25 percent of the people who use any of those drugs who will become addicted. Um, so that means that most people who use these drugs are not addicted. 
if most of the people who are using these drugs are not addicted, then why in the hell do all of the movies or the vast majority of the movies that you see about drugs deal with addiction? Well, because addiction is sexy and you watch. Um, it's a lot less sexy to say, watch a movie about someone who uses heroin on the weekend and then goes to work on Monday and Tuesday and whenever they're scheduled to go to work and they handle all of their responsibilities. That, that would be a boring movie. So you have addiction because addiction is more sexy or sexier and sex sells. Sometimes people hear terms like the functional addict or the functioning addict. Um, uh, that's a misnomer. There's no such thing. If someone is functioning, and they are not uh, having any problems with their drug use, they're not an addict. Addiction is defined by the social and behavioral disruptions um, simply because somebody is using crack cocaine um, and their function doesn't make them an addict. Um, uh, for, we can think about people who drink alcohol uh, on a regular basis. Uh, we don't call them functional addicts or functional alcoholics. We, particularly in the UK, we call those people citizen. I have seen local media clips where Fox News drives up and down Kensington and they're filming underneath the tunnels and they uh, are portraying the situation uh, like like a safari. Our Hank Flynn took a trip to Kensington today. That's where some longtime residents are fed up with this. That is a heroin needle lying on the side of a street right next to a school. Jerry Mariner says he'd never leave Kensington. He raised his family there. But look at these pictures he took. He's sick and tired of the heroin trade happening right on his stoop. The selling, the using, the prostitution. This is it. He's at his wit's end. I took the trash out two weeks ago. And there's a dude laying in my trash. I mean, it's where he belongs, really. And that's my opinion. I mean, people feel sorry for his people. I don't. They're shooting it from their car window. I mean, this isn't journalism. They're too scared to get out of their car and talk to these people. They wouldn't know how to talk to these people because the guy running the show is wearing a buttoned up blue shirt and he's already got his mind made up about who these people are. That type of coverage in the media is exactly why I do what I do because I think that that's bullshit and I need to fight back against that kind of stuff. We're not looking at more pictures of recovery because we're still in a crisis mode. America has an insatiable appetite for prescription opioids. Opioids are now the biggest drug epidemic in American history. Time Magazine just put out a piece with James Nactway. You know, they hired a war photographer to photograph a war as they saw it. This is an epidemic and when war is happening, you tend to see photographs of battle, not of victories. Maybe it's inherent to the way the media works. As a tool for social change, I think a lot of people would presume that showing how horrible a situation is would be the most effective way to um, try to help a scenario. And I did that myself for a number of years. But now I think it's most important that I show that recovery is possible and prove to people that you can come back from an addiction. I think that that will prove to be equally as effective because it's a significant part of the truth. It's a significant part of the story that we've been overlooking. You know, I can see that over the period of time that he was there, that he was really learning how to tell a story like this in a non-stereotypical way or in a way that transcended some of those photographers, you know, um, heroic author and subject as poor person that needs to be saved tropes. And I think as a, you know, as a respectful portrayal of people who are having these kinds of experiences that we might look down upon in society, this project is, is significantly meaningful because it, it doesn't just treat them like they are these physical props for selling some sort of fantastic idea that he is 
you know, the intrepid photojournalist showcasing misery perfectly beautifully. And it holds much more weight for me now as a project than it did when I was just seeing these kinds of images on Instagram, which I think is a poor platform for a project like this. For me, being involved in this has been a positive thing. Um, I, like I said earlier, I, you know, like what you're doing. I thought it was a great idea. Um, and I still do. And I'm like, kind of like proud to be a part of it. And, and like proud to be a part of something where someone's trying to tell our side of the story. That's the goal, ultimately, to humanize the situation that they're in. Because we, as a society, have for way too long been dehumanizing these people, been demonizing these people, been declaring addicts as morally corrupt, and that's bullshit.